beautiful souls. I hope you're having an amazing day full of synchronicities. And if you're not, I hope that this conversation, may it bring you into the flow of life. I'm so excited to share this conversation. Literally, I recorded the first bit of it on July 29th of this year, 2023. And here we are, October, and I'm finishing it. I've been on a journey this year uh, and these past few months of deeper awakening, deeper realization, stepping into my purpose. If you follow my Instagram, you know that I've been talking about the Great Awakening and I wanted to devote an entire conversation to this because it is so important and I offer in this conversation a few pieces of the larger conversation around this spiritual renaissance that's happening around this new enlightenment wave that's occurring um, and the different spaces and places we might be hearing about this, whether science, whether spiritual, whatever. So without further ado, settle in and enjoy being invited into the possibility that you, your soul, chose to incarnate on earth at this time to be a part of this great awakening. We are living in a time, an era that I know in my heart will one day be looked back upon and be called the Great Awakening. There are many reasons we can already see in what is happening and the ways in which history is not repeating itself, but we see a pattern here of evolution on a scale that is massive. And the direction it is going, I believe, is incredible for humanity. And there are so many reasons, and we'll dive into some of those today. And I want to start with a quote from my philosophy love from Arthur Schopenhauer. He said, all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. I believe that we've been through the ridicule. We've been through the opposition. That was the 60s. That was the 70s. We talked about this in our previous conversation, the cultural revolution that's happening now. And this is going further. Obviously, this is much older than the 60s and 70s. And there is a parallel that exists between what was trying to happen at that time and what was sparked by some of the terrible things that predated the 60s and 70s and those seedlings of the elevation of consciousness in the United States culturally and spiritually. Obviously, there has been immense historical thousands of years of repression and pushback against pieces of truth that have come through different spiritual traditions and teachers. So just putting that one out there. 
what is that cultural revolution? What is that global revolution of this era on earth? Not only for humanity, but for all living beings because the consciousness of earth is elevating. Thus, the vibration of the earth is shifting. I believe we are headed in the direction of this great awakening being self-evident in our lives. One of the greatest reasons I believe this is because the role that the sharing of information plays on a global scale because of the internet, because of our access to information, that this will be in our lifetime and it will be seen as self-evident. I am a grad student of the leading researcher on the neuroscience and psychology that is evidence that we are spiritual beings, that our brains are literally wired for spiritual perception. Dr. Lisa Miller. I'll link her work in the show notes. But I'm not here to look for that evidence. I'm in this program because I know that evidence already in my life and I know that truth. I'm not looking for evidence. I'm lucky enough that it already found me, that it already showed itself to me which is why I have a sense and surrender what my role is in the Great Awakening. It's still being revealed to me. And more and more, every single day, I let go of what my small self thinks that role is, and I let the divine intelligence work through me, show me, reveal me to the way, and I will follow the path. Because I know how to listen to the cues in my body and how to trust my intuition now after years of not. I truly believe that every single person here on earth incarnated and chose to be on this planet at this time for this reason. It's a higher perspective of what's going on, of the chaos and destruction that we see. But this chaos is necessary for us to see the ways in which our illusions and our forgetting as the human family has shaped the creations that we've made here on earth and have caused separation, which is not the truth of existence at all. Again, it's what quantum physics is showing us because these sciences, science only reveals to us what we knew in our hearts already to be true. Even if Galileo was wrong about perhaps how the solar system worked, then He still knew there is a working behind this. There is a purpose behind it. It is not purposeless, purposeless, purposelessness, and it is not coincidence. There is a plan. There is a divine intelligence. There is an organization that we cannot see, and I will dedicate my life to seeing that, to showing that. That's science. the role and explosion of collective interest in Carl Jung's prolific and inclusive philosophy and psychology and understanding of the psyche as it relates to spirit is self-evident of what's happening right now. It is the one reason 
I went to get a master's degree because that's what I want to know. That's what I want to learn because that touches truth so deeply to me. And that's what I want to share. That's, it's a pathway. It's a process for this living and this knowing and the new way that is already here. So some of us don't need science to trust what we know. That's spirituality, that's religion, that's knowing. Not belief, not hope, not faith, knowing. You know in your body because you are that, because you were created by that, because it's the organization of every cell in your body that functions without you thinking that knows exactly how to breathe, how to be, how to absorb all nutrients and eliminate waste. That's not the small self. So what science shows us is the quote-unquote evidence, the materialism that comes from the quote-unquote beyond, from the energy, the vibration. The holographic theory of the universe tells us that everything is buzzing pure potential at the unmanifest level. That potential can do nothing but manifest. That energy, that vibration, is what then creates the physical. Science is a process of describing what is seen in the physical. But as we are moving to the post-materialism era of science, atomic to subatomic, to everything is vibrating because everything is moving. Because the foundation of the material are waves of potential that manifest into the minutity that begin to make up the subatomic, the atomic, continue the building blocks that we thought were it, but oh, there's more now. So if we need science to show us that, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being skeptical for the fact that over the past 2,000 plus years of humanity, we've been living in dogma. Not thinking for ourselves out of fear. Fear of oppression, fear of control, fear of death. Fear of governments, fear of churches, fear of fill in the blank, fear of being kicked out of the group. So it makes sense why you might have a little opposition to being told what's up. But it's a beautiful thing that science is now being able to show us what our ancient ancestors knew. They knew because they were in it, because there was nothing separating them from it. But don't be confused by the fact that because our brains show us how spirituality registers in the functioning of our brains in a specific area, that because the brain does that, that means I am spiritual. No, 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 no. You are spiritual, so it shows in the brain. The tree is here because of the waves of potential that manifest to the subatomic level that form the particles of the tree. The tree is not here because the tree is here. Just as... You are not here just because you are here. You are energy, you are vibration, you are frequency that manifested. Manifested by the most powerful energy in the universe, sex. That which 
for thousands of years, especially as women, we were shunned, ostracized, murdered for knowing that, for being in that power. But how beautiful it is that that is being reclaimed. That the art of sexual magic and Tantra is being revitalized and the feminine is being restored to her wild and powerful nature to balance the patriarchy. The pendulum doesn't need to swing completely to the other side in order for us to restore. In fact, It's one of the greatest things that we can see as individuals and decide to be the balance. Because that's what happens. One thing happens and we swing to the extreme. Patriarchy, matriarchy, matriarchy, patriarchy. But balance, union, the sacredness of everyone's journey and everyone's being here The sacredness of seeing the sacredness in all. Even the person that I want to ostracize and kick out of the group. That's the divine. If I am, they are. We all are. Everything is. That is why we are to be the embodiment. To be the change you wish to see in the world. That quote from Gandhi has spoke to me since I was 12 because it is so true and I went on my own journey with this and now I get to share this from my own experience of learning this lesson that if you want to teach other people don't tell don't preach embody you and your life are the living word and example of truth so long as we live from it and in it and that is why it's our own personal work that is my greatest devotion because it's the foundation of everything my therapist used to tell me just embody it Lydia You don't have to teach them. You don't have to change them. You don't have to tell them. This was, you know, around family or around friends or lovers, whatever it is. Embody. That is the greatest teacher. That is the greatest example. Then people, your kids that you want to meditate, your partner that you want to be more spiritual, whatever. Then they just see you in your truth, in your authenticity, in your power, in your example. And that makes everyone curious. And that's the greatest invitation into our own awakenings. So embodying inner union of the masculine and feminine is the greatest sacred union. It's the union of the one. It what, it's what transforms us into anthropos into the fully realized and actualized human that is beyond the small self that is the true self that is the androgynous that is spirit that is the one manifest through an asme that's the union of polarity masculine feminine dark light sacred union within is what creates union throughout. The restoration and rebalancing of the masculine and feminine, the matriarchy and patriarchy for a new world to be created, which is the kingdom of heaven that is already here, is the realization first within and thus throughout. As within, so throughout. As above, so below. As below, so above. These secret teachings, these aphorisms, 
They are the key. They are what's been hiding in plain sight that's now being able to be shown. Quantum physics, as above, so below. Holographic universe, holographic theory of the mind, projecting onto reality what we experience, as within, so throughout. We could say that this era is what has come because it is the only solution to the level of chaos and destruction that is also present, to the constant threat of nuclear warfare and the question of disarmament, the burning of the earth and the destruction and pillaging of her is a resource instead of our relative, in the words of Caitlin Duquette. So perhaps this awakening to the truth of who we are is the solution, as I have been saying, is the way forward, the remembrance of what we once knew and the harmony that that can ring in. Because with all of the social constructs and beliefs we have agreed to, which I spoke about with Sam in our episode of Art in the Human Experience, everything is a construct. Everything that we exist in, that we agree to, on societal levels, that this is bad and that is good, that this person is in charge and that person is a subordinate. These are all constructs. Someone made these up and we collectively agree to them and play in them. But what's happening, the reckoning that's happening in this spiritual great awakening is that those constructs must be remade in, over, in order to move forward. We must form a new understanding. And the beauty of this awakening, one person at a time, is that that understanding occurs in everyone and it's shared. Just as every religion shares the same core beliefs. We are one. Respect everyone and know everyone as sacred. Everything And everything is love. It is our wounds and our small self that bring us out of that. The constructs that we socially agreed to do not reflect that. So the chaos is to destroy the constructs. And that might sound super heady. But the examples of that can look as concrete as... The United States prison industrial complex does not actually create reconciliation and harmony, but perpetuates a problem. But when we see every person in the mistakes we all make because we have forgotten who we truly are as the manifestation and extension of creation itself, then Okay, my brother, tell me what led you to this forgetting so much so that you thought you had to hurt another person in order to get what you need and how can we fix it together? How can we reconcile? And there are countless examples of people, indigenous groups, that have completely different practices of reconciliation and how they've worked. Post-genocide Rwanda is a powerful example. And there are so many more. Google them. If you're curious, go Google them, please. And when we know that the punishing of another is the manifestation of the punishing of ourselves because we believe ourselves to be bad, we believe it to be good to separate, to protect, 
to defend, but when we acknowledge there's nothing to defend or protect because we are all that and we are all born in love, then it's reconciliation and reckoning. And then the constructs shift to reflect that at the personal level to the societal level. A key definition of this moment is the difference between the ways that certain mystical, spiritual, philosophic traditions were quote-unquote revealed and shared. I'm thinking of hermetic philosophy. I'm thinking of the actual Gnostic wisdom of the man Yeshua and this constant repeated phrase of may those who have ears to hear hear and I believe the key difference between those times 2000 plus years ago and where we are today is the fact that While these words were once only for those who could truly hear, as in understand, know, embody, live, willing to change themselves from the foundation of self-knowledge that they were born into through the world they were born into, to the wisdom that was gained of the truer nature of reality and the self as a manifestation of that foundation of reality, that divine spiritual foundation, where that was once a secret, so to speak, the time has come for all to hear. While some might not have ears to hear currently in our times, there is a, I see a key distinction in the fact that while this revelation, this remembrance, this awakening of the great awakening will bring fire, bring destruction, bring this force of decay, which is the decay of the old way because we have to let go of the old in order to embrace the new the true, that's not the point. The point is that here and now, in this era of the Great Awakening, it is time for us as humanity to awaken to the kingdom, heaven, which has always been here on earth and within ourselves. I'll say that again. It is time to awaken to the kingdom which has always been here on earth and within ourselves. We must truly live this knowing in the places, spaces, and trials where it's hardest. Not the moments it's easy to see and feel the bliss of union with the divine and feeling loved, held, guided, never alone. It's in those moments where we're being tried, where we're facing our greatest fears and where we're being actually invited into an opportunity in this school on earth to grow and expand and see that all of our fears are based on an illusion. That ultimately this fear of death, with which we can say is truly the crux of most of our fears, is the misperception and misunderstanding of the true nature of reality itself and thus our place in reality and the beautiful thing about this great awakening is all of the science that is being able to show what all of the great spiritual traditions have been trying to help us understand which is that we can't die There is no death when we truly know ourselves and know reality and know where we come from, then our fears 
are shown as these wrong perceptions. That's the Buddhist psychological tradition. Our suffering is caused by our illusions, our wrong perceptions. So when we truly know and we are one with the fact that we are the manifestation of the divine, having this human experience through us, just as the tree in front of me is the divine, just as my shit is the divine, just as throwing up, there's the divine right there. Everything, the greatest things that we label as evil, the divine is there. There is no separation. So when we are brought to these places that challenge our perception where it's hardest, that is how we begin to truly know and live as one, as embodiments of our high self here on earth to awaken and to be a part of this moment in time and space. That is how we shift from having beliefs, having faith, to having knowledge. We have experience and knowledge. We have a new, quote unquote, new as in awakened to us, but not new as in it just arrived. It's always been here. It's been here since before the beginning of time. It exists outside of time and space because it is the foundation and fabric of reality itself. We have a new and true foundation of who we truly are as manifestations of the divine, always in and surrounded by the divine in everything, everything. As humanity slowly awakens from the slumber of our ignorance to this scientific fact, because the science of spirituality is beginning to simply give a different form of language and knowing to what we've already known, to what has already been revealed. The key is that it has always been for everyone. It has always been everyone's birthright. It has always been everyone's innate knowing. The difference is the, I don't want to say the pressure that we all must awaken, but it is the time, it is the era, it is come to the pinnacle that awakening is inevitable. We've had so much quote unquote progress and development and expansion of human capacity and human capability and thus human consciousness. And this is the reality that we must awaken to of the foundations of our consciousness itself. And that is for everyone to hear. And while we might have to and get to retrain our ears to be able to truly hear and know, to practice that tradition of using everything as an opportunity to awaken to, how am I having a misperception here? Then we have eyes to see. It's no longer shrouded in secrecy and mystery, it's the revelation of the kingdom of heaven on earth that has always been here and always been within. And it is everyone's birthright. It is your birthright. It is my birthright. It is the person that you hate the most in this world. It is their birthright. And so much changes when we know this when we experience this, when we live this, and like I said, most of all, when we are willing to utilize every greatest 
challenge that tries our knowing and challenges our knowing of this fact to change our perception. This commitment to the change of perception is the liberation of our entire experience with ourselves, with each other, with the world, with government, with populations, with peace. This is the foundation because this is the foundation of reality. And so that's how we begin to see on a larger scale, this is the greatest work. This is the greatest misperception that we've had, this great forgetting that's happened. And we can talk about, and I believe it's important to talk about and unpack and uncover why that happened and what different pieces, historical burnings of libraries and sacred texts, Uh, the mixing of religion and government for power and population control. We don't have to get into conspiracy theories, but it is important to understand one of the greatest wars that's been waged on humanity and to understand how your and my and our liberation and peace and power has always been here, is always here, And it's a choice that we make in every moment to actualize, to actualize ourselves, to actualize that dimension of reality from which we can all live. I've shared this Ram Dass quote before that essentially says, we are always dwelling in grace. It is only our thinking mind that ever falls out of grace. We can substitute grace with the kingdom with heaven, with peace, whatever you want your word to be. But this fact of reality that innately is love. Because when we truly know this, what is there to fear? What is there to be afraid of in the face of death. And there are so many elements that I've discovered in my own journey that are a key part of this that allow me to, I'm not saying I don't have fears, I have plenty of fears. Now I engage with them as what's my misconception here? Because my true foundation of my life has been rebuilt on this dimension, this truth that the kingdom of heaven on earth is here all around me always and within me and is only my mind my perceptions my fears my psyche that puts me in different dimensions through perception of experience i love this invitation that there are truly only two psychological illnesses possession and the loss of soul the loss of soul i would equate to like depression loss of vitality loss of will that dimension and as that relates to this conversation as a generalization because we're talking about the loss of soul and the symptoms that that creates I truly believe, and I have found it in my own experience and many people's experience at the core, that loss of soul is the disconnection from the soul of life itself, from the great spirit source, God, the universe, the goddess, whatever you want to call it, that that is the true nature of reality and that I am an emanation of that loss of soul is the disconnection from that truth the looking at life from the materialistic perspective that we were all born into to see and seek and find affirmation of worthiness through successes through what we do 
obviously to me that contributes to and is the source of the loss of soul because we are disconnected from the soul within, from our soul above, and from soul throughout life that there is a deeper, greater meaning innately embedded in the life that we live and the world that we inhabit. Whereas possession is anxiety, fear, neurosis when it feels as if something has taken over me in my mind and my experience thus of reality so the key though and the things that I have found in physical embodied experience that makes such a difference is one past life regressions there's a book I'll link it in the description in the show notes, many lives, many masters. It is the revelation through an experience with one of his patients, a um, prominent psychologist in the 60s, after 18 months of doing traditional therapy with one of his clients who couldn't overcome certain fears or anxieties that were conflicting with her life and her quality of life ended up doing hypnosis and what came through in the hypnosis is or hypnotic sessions were her past life experiences that had created these anxieties in this current lifetime when I was 12 and I first learned about Buddhism I intellectually understood reincarnation and embraced it but my foundation of reality had no example and no experience of that as truth. And it wasn't until people in my life truly began to die and I began to receive symbols and synchronicities, signs and messages from them that I had a physical experience with the other side. And then once I read this book, I fully understood I began to see how some of my own fears in my childhood were probably from past life experiences and then I attracted to me literally put out the intention I want to do a past life regression I don't know anyone that is that does them around me I don't you know and I didn't go google search it either I just put out that intention and then maybe two days later cross paths with someone that brought it up and said that she knew someone that would gladly give me a regression and it's been my experience with these regressions not only do they help me understand myself in this lifetime and my purpose in this lifetime but they give me a solid experience of yes death happens and new life happens and it's an embodied experience which is different from every winter I watch death and life occur. The other piece is an understanding of myself and who I am and the dimensions of my psyche and experience as the human Lydia and as the high self soul that incarnates into this body. And this distinction between certain aspects, perspectives, fears of what I call the small self, probably very closely linked to the ego, which has and can struggle with the foundation of this knowing as my lived experience, because we have a lived experience as this little human on this little world which you know nature is foundationally harmonious and beautiful and loving and it is also aggressive and deadly and that is both right that's the divine feminine incarnate in the great mother which is both love and aggression the foundation of the earth that we live on and so that is to say that the small human self which is an animal has real perceptions and knowings of that 
but it is the beauty of our divine intelligence as this embodied high self soul in this human vessel that we can see and know and transition our basis of existence to I am the light incarnate. I am the divine. Rather, I am not the divine. The divine is me having this experience. And I love this play and this exploration of, right, hyperlink clicking what I just said, this tendency that we have to project self onto the divine versus knowing that the divine comes through us. As my teacher, Dr. Lisa Miller says, like rays emanating from the sun. We are the ray. That doesn't mean I, Lydia, am God. It means God, source, spirit, divine, universe, Allah, Jesus, Buddha is me having this experience through me just like it is my dog, just like it is my, the tree in front of me, just like it is you, just like it is the person that you hate most in this world. So this ability to re-know ourselves in our truth is that other key in the separation and ability to watch when the small self comes up and the small self is thinking and the small self is fearing and to reground and re-anchor in the truth of this fabric of reality. And I promise It is a felt, embodied experience to move from thinking of ourselves as the small self to knowing and living in the world and moving through the world while in this union, this knowing of I am a ray emanating from the sun of source. Source is radiating through me. And that is my true self. You feel it. You feel it in every cell in your body. You feel it in the vibration that you operate in. You see it in the world that you inhabit and how you shift immediately into a different dimension of reality. Which is why this is part of the Great Awakening. Because we are awakening to this fact of reality as a fact, as a science, as part of quantum physics, as part of the science of spirituality that is being researched and not being discovered because it's always been here, but being uncovered, being given language, being given beautiful graphs and brain scans. And lastly, when we understand the nature of reality as always providing for us as the great capital M mind of the universe that works through our mind understanding how our mind is also a hologram like projection and perception of reality, how much information we don't process of reality in our normal states of consciousness, how we can alter our states of consciousness for a more clear embodied understanding of our own reality, which is so essential. Don't just listen to me say these things. There are plenty of practices. There are plenty of ways that you can ask your questions and receive your own answers, your own knowing from your embodied experience in a practice, in a ritual, in a ceremony. And that is the most important thing. That is how we shift from dogma to invitation to the divine self knowing that you have, that is your birthright. 
these are the rituals and the ceremonies that I facilitate. It is why I facilitate. It is why I practice because I don't just talk. I'm sharing a pathway, a way, all of the ways that we can all walk each other home. First, we have to walk ourselves home. This is home. What we're talking about right here, that's home. We can live from here. We can play from here. We can be from here as here. And that is my priestess work. That is my facilitating. That is what I am blessed to get to do. And why it is so important and so foundational to everything else that we want to shift, to experience more freedom and more life. And the reality is, we all will end up at the same knowing because look at all the great spiritual traditions. They share core principles, core outlooks, core perceptions, and that is how we know truth. There is ultimate truth. Not everything is just subjective. Subjectivity and is derived from the universal truth. And like the platonic ideals or forms, we can have ideas of what that great truth is. Like 8 billion different sides of a diamond. Each one of us can know one side. Have one touch at that great truth. And when we share it and when we converse about it and when we get curious about each of our knowings and we are open then we receive more awareness of that great truth. And we get to live from that openness, which is the kingdom, heaven on earth, peace, unity, love, respect. So then it truly puts into perspective how the most important thing to focus on is when am I acting out of habit and out of a wrong perception and understanding of myself and reality. And here's an invitation and an example of how I engage with this that might offer you a new way to engage instead of going with the ego's threat against its own boundaries and its own self-knowledge. In the book, Thoughts Without a Thinker by Mark Epstein, which I will link in the show notes, it offers the psychological truth that our personality, which I would say instead of personality, I would substitute how we know ourselves and how we engage with the world is constructed by the exact things that we want to avoid. This self is, quote, constructed out of a reaction against just what we do not wish to acknowledge, end quote, about ourselves. And when I read this, a few years ago, I don't know, maybe like six, certainly ten, If I read that, I would get really frustrated, really overwhelmed, and not want to engage with it because it was threatening to my entire construction of myself, how I knew myself. But now when I read that, I say, yes, what don't I want to acknowledge? And I go and I write that shit down. I put it on paper. Used to be afraid of putting the darkness on paper. Now I want it all on the paper. So it's out of me. So it's clear. If it's not running in my subconscious, then it can't run me. So what don't you want to acknowledge about how you feel about yourself, how you think about yourself, how you think about the world? What possible beliefs might you formed out of experiences from your childhood 
meaning that you assign that might not necessarily be true about you, but because of those experiences that were so overwhelming and so threatening in that moment, you formed this belief and thus constructed yourself unconsciously as a reaction to what we don't want to acknowledge, thus giving it right back to us. That's what we're looking for because that's the only thing that takes us out of grace, of the kingdom, of union with the divine, of actually knowing ourselves and our lives in truth of who we truly are and what is truly happening here beyond the humdrum of everyday life. And that is actually what changes the humdrum of everyday life. That is what it means that when we see gratitude, when we see abundance, we get more things to be grateful for. We have more abundance. What's funny and important in this conversation actually is the role of science. Because even after thousands of years of repression, of forgetting, of silencing, of ignorance, as we expose and remember and reclaim and awaken to and live in and embody the truth once more, this time The difference from all other times in humanity is that it can't be undone. We can't come back from it because what is being unleashed, what is being revealed is truth in a way that shows and tells in multiple ways of knowing. We, since the seedlings of human consciousness as differentiated from our ancestral pre-hominid consciousness is this role of mysticism and shamanism, the revelation and the knowing that is mystical, that is intuitive, and that is just as valuable. Philosophically, we've lived in a world that valued one kind of knowing, logic and reason over all other kinds. Science, it's why we've had an imbalance. But as we return to the awareness that the mystical, the intuitive, the scientific, the logical can all be saying the same things and are equally valuable and there is no higher or lower, then we see that, again, just like the great spiritual traditions all share commonalities, there are going to be and there already exists, and I know from my own experience, there are commonalities across all these different forms of knowing. The importance is that as science is a, for better or worse, it is what it is, as science as a ruling factor in our paradigm, the current beliefs that shape our world, as science reveals the quote-unquote evidence the trace facts of these truths that have been known and shared for tens of thousands of years in human history as the basis of our human experience and our experience of the universe. We can't go back to ignorance. We can't undo this knowing that is happening. That is why it is a great awakening. That is why it is changing our world and that is why it is for everyone because everyone is included in this and it's really interesting that while this is happening and while this shift is occurring in America especially there is this fight and contrast 
around science. And for me, I've been discussing this with a few friends, and I think it's quite interesting that I am pursuing my own seeking of knowledge in a scientific institute, the psychology of spirituality, the science of spirituality, consciousness, quantum physics, because I have never felt the need for evidence to validate what I know to be true in my mystical knowing, in my intuitive knowing, in my heart knowing, another form of knowing. And yet in that experience of mine, I've come to understand that my role and my service, how important the science is in this awakening. Because while we have a contrast in the United States of a pushback against science, a questioning of the scientific method, as someone who was trained in the scientific method from a very young age, I actually finally understand that part of my journey, that part of my education, even though I've never needed it. How important it is for the whole, for the collective, so we can touch capital T truth, so we can share. There's nothing to argue about. It's the method. It's been proven. A hawk literally just flew across my view as I share this. That's a sign. That's a synchronicity. That's a blessing. Communication in this dialogue of the great existence that this is the higher perspective. This is where we're going. And I actually see like the scientific method and why the scientific method is so important in this is that it can be replicated. The entire purpose of the scientific method is that a study, an experiment can be replicated and it is in the replication that we can find and touch more truth. If replication occurs so that we see the same results, then we know we're on to something. And the reality is that that method exists also in shamanism, in mysticism, in the great foundations of our human experience that is our, scienti- our spiritual knowing of our world and our connection to it and our ability to know There is a method, there is a technical process that is across all shamanistic traditions, all mystical traditions that we can each replicate to experience and to find our own knowing. And that's the importance of this dimension of the conversation because there have been traditions and the pushback against dogma, which again, I think we see collectively as a decline in religion. It doesn't mean God is dead. It doesn't mean that there is no place for spirit in life. I think it's the result of us looking for real spirit in life, not being told what to believe, And people are seeking, we are seeking, we're here having this conversation because we seek to know for ourselves, to experience for ourselves. And that is why it's helpful to have teachers that have walked that path, that know a little bit of the map of the underworld, that know the map of the other worlds, that know the experience and can share those technical tools and processes and practices and rituals like the scientific method. Here, replicate this yourself. This is what I found. That is how I approach all of my work with my clients. 
and in my experiences that I facilitate, that's the priestess. She knows the divine in all. She gives you the tools to not only heal yourself, but to touch the divine birthright of your own divine intelligence and DNA. And that's also why this resurrection of all forms of knowing as again, being able to look at different sides of the diamond. Science is not complete without spirituality. All of these other, these disciplines, if you look on the Reself website, I have a visual of this that I adapted from a visual that Virgil Abloh created. We keep disciplines separate what we've started to do is intersect them. The reality is that they all overlap, like literally laid on top of each other. And I, this is such a powerful visual because it speaks to me of the truth of what is. We're all talking about the one, the same thing from all different perspectives, from all different angles, and we need to be in dialogue. And it's when they come together that we have a truer sense of what is and who we are. And so on this beautiful October, early afternoon, as the sun pours in through the trees and the leaves are just beginning to change, I offer us in conclusion to see this as a time of the harvest, this great awakening that is the era that we are living in, is the harvesting of all of our ancestors' work so that we may know the truth of our existence and build a world on that. We are harvesting the seemingly separate results of contemplation across the world, across time, of the nature of reality and existence and our place in it, of spiritual traditions varied and diverse, of the birth of the scientific method, of the darkness and light that exists here, that is but two sides of the same one. I invite you to begin your harvest and to rise into your role, your purpose, the reason that you incarnated here on earth at this time of the Great Awakening. And know that I am here holding you in this vision of the divine manifest through you, that that is your truth, that I know you as that, regardless and especially through all that you go through and all that you've experienced. I see you. And I know that is your service and that is your purpose. And I'm here for you to hold that vision, to hold that vibration, to hold that truth when you forget. And I'm here to serve as best as I can as a channel for your remembrance, my remembrance. Have a great week. And enjoy the unraveling and the harvesting of the mysteries and magic of the life that you live, the earth that you dwell on, the beautiful body that your soul is housed in temporarily and heaven that is here right now. 
bless.